Well, let's bring on an expert on this uh, topic, someone who's been uh, namely kind of in the crosshairs because uh, the Hindu American Foundation has been called out uh, repeatedly by uh, some of these folks trying to get uh, cast on the books uh, in different venues. Suhag Shukla joins us now, uh, and we really appreciate her uh, her time uh, because uh, she's been making the rounds on, on different uh, media venues uh, as someone who's been seeing uh, this matter uh, develop over a number of years. So Suhag, thank you for being with us. Give us your perspective on, on what took place in Seattle. Was it done in a hasty manner, or is this just the way laws like this get on the books? You know, laws are definitely not made in this manner. I mean, first of all, um, to Jonathan's point, yes, uh, there was a ground game, but the ground game actually came from across the country. Um, these were not local people concerned about a local issue. Um, and I would say that those who are going to be most directly impacted by this were the ones who were opposing the proposal, and they were caught off guard. Um, in terms of rulemaking, um, to be able to, you know, a lot of the headlines say that history has been made. Yes, history has been made that after a century, we're seeing laws that specify and single out communities, specifically communities of color. You know, it was bad enough that the original proposal said South Asians. And I think that, you know, some of the letters that we had sent expressing and um, flagging some constitutional concerns about equal protection and due process got the council member to try to remedy it. And she actually made it worse. She added uh, Southeast Asians, specifically Japanese people, as well as some African communities. And she called out Nigerians, um, Senegalese and Somali people as somehow being so inherently bigoted alongside South Asians that we merit a special law that's going to police our communities. Yusuwag, I wanted to ask you really quick. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you've been following Sawand in her career, I'm sure, from a distance. What's her angle here? What's her motive in suddenly bringing this up? Because, uh, again, her playbook seems to be everything you just laid out. She's all about mobilizing, but also bringing in a tremendous amount of support from outside of Seattle, not just nationally, but she also has a global following. What is she trying to accomplish with this? Look, I think she and her allies are more concerned about politics in India and the ground that they've lost there. Um, the current political party in power, the BJP, is to them, you know, just uh, Nazism or whatever it is, in spite of the fact that this is a democratically elected government there and a party there. So uh, what's happening is that the Indian American community becomes collateral damage. They're dragging issues from India to city councils where honestly the focus should be on safe streets, safe neighborhoods, and instead expending money on targeting minorities and making the city of Seattle um, less safe and less welcome for all people. So, Hog, I want to play a video for you that was released by the Equality Labs uh, Executive Director, uh, Tenmori Sundarajan. We've had uh, her come on uh, our programs in the past and, and uh, very articulate, passionate about uh, this subject matter. Uh, I want to get your reaction to what she said in the aftermath of the Seattle law getting passed. Sure. Jay Beam from Seattle on this wonderful historic day where uh, Seattle has become first in the nation to ban caste discrimination. It is the first city outside of South Asia to do so. And I just want to tell everybody this is a win that is rooted in Dalit feminism. You know, we have seen here that this is where an intersectional politics really work. And we won because caste oppressed people were not alone. We were flanked by workers. We were flanked by other feminists, people who work with survivors of domestic violence, queer folks, indigenous folks, black liberationists. There was no movement that didn't see themselves in Dalit struggle because we were already deeply embedded with them in a shared vision for liberation. So I'm so proud to be here and to have seen this incredible win. And for folks to know just the scope and the scale of what we did, we had over 4,000 emails, 200 organizations, and a coalition of 30 caste depressed civil rights organizations that make up and support over hundreds of thousands of caste depressed people across North America. So this is our time. And I think the caste equity movement is such a beacon of hope because basically, you know, we are making interfaith and intercaste alliances that really help us confront our intergenerational wounds. 
And what we are seeing is that South Asians do not want to be connected to each other through the trauma of caste anymore. And so it's incredible to see these kinds of political processes as um, pathways for deep healing. And we had many people who testified for the first time. And I think the thing that I was just so moved by was that how our people turned pain into power. Is there hope? There is definitely hope. And in many ways, the organizing around the caste equity movement is so powerful because it shows us a different way of how we might interact with each other as South Asians. It tells us that we can let go of our intergenerational trauma and build meaningful intercaste, interfaith, and multiracial relationships. Relationships that can heal us as well as point us to radical Dalit feminist futures. Jay Beam and Jay Safatri. Uh, I think her pitch is like letter perfect now in terms of what she's trying to get across. Uh, give me your perspective. Well, um, I I don't think um, she's actually solved any problems. Um, the Carnegie Endowment um, survey, one of the, the most uh, reliable surveys on Indian American attitudes show that caste-based discrimination is exceedingly rare. I would say that even one case is one too many and existing policies have not even been tested. And there are categories like national origin and ancestry that ha are a broad umbrella. Um, they're facially neutral, meaning that they don't necessarily point to any single person from a group or a background that's always going to be seen as a victim or is always going to be seen as the victimizer. And so categories like ancestry um, or even ethnicity and national origin adjacent categories are broad enough and are generally applicable enough that they have evolved as America becomes increasingly diverse. And so these could and should arguably cover caste-based discrimination. Uh, I think that a couple years down the line, um, her legacy will be that she endangered a micro minority in this community and she endangers people from all social backgrounds, from all caste backgrounds. You know, they talk in these terms of caste oppressed and caste dominant. We're all here in the United States as a micro minority, brown, you know, visibly a, a minority. And um, there are areas where we need to be working together um, against the types of discrimination that the vast majority of Indians do report facing. That same survey, Carnegie said that over half the people um, surveyed, and there were a thousand people responding to that, said that they had faced some sort of discrimination. Most of them were facing color-based discrimination. So to now put a target on all of us um, with these special policies that now put the target on all South Asians is the classic self-goal. And that is what her legacy is going to be. Suhaga, you know, I was listening to, you know, what was just shared moments ago, and, you know, Equality Labs is clearly an advocacy group, yet at the same time, I'm listening to that, and half of that I couldn't even follow. What about for the average Indian American, right, the average Hindu American? How are they feeling about this? Because it sounds like I'm talking or listening to an academic, and I want to know how this translates actually into the diaspora to the average person just listening to this language and this talk? How are they reacting and feeling right now? Yeah, I think, you know, for a lot of average people, what we've learned in our conversations with the community is one, a lot of people don't know what the downstream impact is going to be. Because on paper, um, and in the way that they've been able to kind of build the narrative and, and get the support from the mainstream media is there's this widespread discrimination, which is not founded in any verifiable evidence, but in their survey, Equality Lab survey, um, which the Carnegie survey has a lot to say about, including the fact that there's confirmation bias, sample bias, manipulation of data by throwing out um, responses where people did not respond with a cast. Um, and so you have this inflation of numbers for the purpose of advocacy. And now you have policies that are being made on, um, on that basis. Now, some of the testimony, or if you read the report, the Equality Labs report, what are the types of things that they're saying are indication of caste-based discrimination? A vegetarian diet, going to the temple, um, celebrating Diwali or Holi. So I'm not quite sure that the community is aware of what 
the implementation of this policy will look like because you know that it's Equality Labs and the allies who have shaped the policy. And now when you look at Seattle, for instance, there's funding set aside, $185,000 in the first year, $100,000 going forward. I'm sure there's going to be the hiring of cast experts. Well, who are they going to hire? Of course, they're going to hire the folks that have been kind of on the inside of these policies. And these organizations have a very definitive anti-Hindu record. And that's what we're going to start seeing is that sort of um, kind of silencing effect of Hindus, South Asians generally. And um, that is what's the travesty of the situation. Let me ask a quick follow-up. Aside from HAF and some others, when will Indian Americans mobilize and start fighting back for real and really getting involved? What is that going to potentially look like? You know, I I really think that, look, the, the whole equation of caste with Indians or caste with Hinduism is something that is a legacy from colonialism. And it's a narrative that's the predominant narrative. It is fortified through our public school education system where sixth graders learn this very reductive and inaccurate depiction of Indian society and Indians. Um, so the narrative is going to be one that's a very tough battle to face. I think where the best hope is, is in the courts, uh, because the United States is built on principles of equal protection and due process. That's why we've taken a similar uh, policy uh, with the Cal State University system in California, where we're supporting two faculty members who are saying, hey, wait a minute, you can't just add a category that's facially discriminatory, where all of the legislative intent and testimony focused in on and demonized South Asians and then think that you are going to be protecting all people in the same way um, on those campuses. So that's where I think um, this battle will ultimately um, come to justice. Is it fair to say, though, there will be like 50 battles like this in every state? You're going to have corporate battles. You'll have local city battles. You might have stuff at the county level, at the federal level. Is that is likely the next step? You know, um, it feels like it, but in my conversations with a number of places that might have been on the verge of passing or, or considering these types of policies, once you're able to sit down and get their ear and show them what legal precedent shows and what the downstream legal ramifications would be in putting into uh into their policies of facially discriminatory uh, category as opposed to facially neutral categories, I think most Americans understand. I think that this whole battle is a microcosm of a broader trend um, that's seeking to divide all of us rather than unify us on the basis of our humanity. You know, one of the aspects of this which is so challenging is that the CSU matter uh, some of these other universities, there have been no actual claims that have come <laughs> forth, you know, in the CSU matter. I mean, there was not one person. I, I'm sure maybe there's some discrimination that took place. And I think that's what's so challenging is I don't think I know anybody that wants over discrimination to take place, but it's really hard when there's not s substantive evidence. I mean, for those of us that like work in that world, I mean, I'm not an attorney, but as a journalist, I mean, we, we cover court cases all the time. You have to have evidence. You can't just make charges. Right. And, and people, and I will say this, discrimination happens at all these different levels. I mean, people discriminate almost on a daily basis. I mean, we're, you know, people get judged for how they look, how they sound, who they associate with. If you look like a CEO or if you look like a homeless person, you get judged. You could be wearing a hoodie and they'll, they'll judge you wear, doing that. So I, I'm, I'm really wondering, you know, what, what you do about these matters when you have these private conversations right. with public officials, because I think it's also going to affect things politically, you know, with 2024 on the horizon, we're seeing this movement spread across the country. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to have a long lasting impact. I mean, uh, anyone who seems to oppose or at least challenge or question what's going on is branded as a bigot, is branded <laughs> as a, a right winger. And it, it's kind of stunning that this is the kind of invective that's out there. Well, to me, if the only counter you have is an ad hominem and you can't debate on the merits then you know you're not really standing on solid ground. And the question for those of us who have opposed the policy is not whether we need to have protections um, 
for caste-based discrimination. It's how are we going to protect against caste-based discrimination? And what we hold is that it has to be existing policy. Now, we know from the, the professors at CSU that when they approached the chancellor, when they approached even the uh, union that's supposed to represent all faculty members, regardless of their background, to ask, well, hey, have there been any allegations, any claims filed? And the answer was no. The same thing um, is happening at Brown University, which was one of the most recent universities to add caste to their non-discrimination policy. They did not have a single allegation made. And the one case that is pending, and that is the one with the uh, California Civil Rights Department having gone after Cisco, um, if you do some digging into the actual facts of the case, there are some real questions that we should be asking about the California state government and perhaps uh, an abuse of power. Certainly the, the defendants are asking that because they have most recently filed a sanctions motion. Um, you know, the story is the way the media has presented that John Doe, who is a self-identified Dalit, was the only Dalit in this department at um, Cisco, and that um, two of these other Indian origin managers discriminated against him. Well, one of those managers is the one who was a classmate of his from IIT, which is like the Indian Institute of Technology. It's like the premier Ivy League of India. The manager recruited him. If this manager, who also happens to have two relatives who are Dalit, had some animus against Dalits, why would he have done that? Um, John Doe also signed a package of you know, several million dollars in stock grants, was amongst the highest paid employees at Cisco. And here's, the, here's this clincher, that in that department, there are only three head positions. One of them was held by a self-identified Dalit. But the story that we have seen in mainstream media is that you have all of these high caste Hindus running amok and, you know, discriminating against this poor soul Dalit. And that if you just go a little bit below the surface into the court records, all of that is there in plain view. That's just unbelievable listening to you right now. And, you know, earlier you alluded to the fact that this fight will really be, you know, in the courts, but at least in terms of the court of public opinion, um, it just isn't getting the proper coverage um, in the mainstream press. And that's why the average American is still clueless about this. How does this get out there then, this important narrative? Because I really believe this could set a precedent, not just for the Indian American community, you know, Hindus out there, but any other group then, right? Or, or anyone else who wants to, you know, start claiming class or, or caste discrimination, right? Yeah. What's stopping others? But at that's... the same time, this story and narrative is so important to understand because I feel like it just keeps popping up out of nowhere. People are being caught off guard. And I think that's the playbook from the you know likes of Shama Sawant and Equality Lab. So again, how does this narrative continue to get out there to the average American? Well, I think this is where shows like this are so important. I mean, we had someone from, you know, a historically socially disadvantaged community um, in India who has been a tech worker here in the United States since um, the early 2000s, pen an op-ed in which he was offering an alternative viewpoint that, look, I don't consider myself oppressed. I am a active member of my Hindu and South Asian community, and I oppose these proposals. I see them as dangerous. I see them as leading to, you know, long term uh discrimination against South Asians. And some of that's going to become very subtle because if South Asians and, and Hindus are seen as carrying this kind of legal morass with them or even this kind of institutionalized implicit bias, why would I want to hire South Asians, right? So he penned an op-ed. I can't tell you how many rejections he saw. We were trying to help him get it pitched because and get it placed because it was an important perspective, one that's been ignored in this very convenient and lazy narrative of there's one group that is perpetually oppressed. You know, let's forget the fact that they've gone to like very wealthy, expensive private schools um, or have lived in some of the highest income areas in the country in California. And yet when there's an alternative viewpoint from that same community, 
it's demonized. In fact, council members um, Sullen also demonized people when I think it was um, council member Nelson, who pointed out that, hey, I've gotten a letter from another group that says that they are Dalit and they oppose this. And she said, well, every community has their kind of sellouts. And she pointed to African-Americans who might oppose some of the trends in in DEI and just immediately diminished their voices. If she is I mean, that's in fact is so um, patronizing because she claims to come from a dominant caste background. So now she's going to silence. Um, where is where is her, you know, call for equality and lifting the voices of the oppressed there when they don't agree with her? Well, it does seem that I think one of the disconnects I have in this matter is because <laughs> Shama Sawant in her speech during uh, that uh, that victory speech effectively said that she was a Brahmin. Uh, and then took her pot shots in India, which I see as kind of a standard practice. But you know, India is being run right now by by Prime Minister Modi, who was democratically elected. And I don't think he came from some kind of fancy upper caste background. From what I recall, I understand he would sell chai uh, at, at train stations as a child. I mean, to me, that sounds like someone who came from nothing and has built this unbelievable career. I think he's quite frankly, the most powerful politician in the world right now. Well, uh, yeah. you know, frankly speaking, he's controlling the world's largest democracy. So I, I, I just find some of this rhetoric, I think it takes away from some of their arguments, which let's face it, I don't think anybody wants discrimination to take place. But you know, I think the evidence has to demonstrate that and people should fight it out and hopefully we'll get this thing uh, settled in, in the courts once and for all. But I do think uh, we've been covering it so aggressively because I think it's a major uh, situation, kind of a flashpoint in terms of our experience here uh, as part of the diaspora. Well, if I could just uh, add a, a couple of things there to what you said is that, um, yes, you're right that the current prime minister, Prime Minister Modi, comes from uh, what's designated as an OBC background. The current president comes from a tribal background. The former president came from a scheduled caste or Dalit background. So, um, you know, that's those are inconvenient facts um, for uh, for the activists that are pushing these policies, uh, because as I said um, at the beginning, their gripe is actually with the current political party in India. Um, and the other, the other thing is that um, in terms of a self goal, quite honestly, the only people that I've been in, seen engaging publicly in casteist rhetoric are these so-called Dalit activists who are constantly demonizing quote unquote Brahmins. And um, so what when I said that they have scored a self goal, what they don't understand is that while in India, there might be embedded into the law ideas of a uh, permanent victim and permanent victimizer in the United States, that's not the case. So some of their rhetoric, if they continue with it, whether they're professors um, teaching and creating a hostile environment in their classrooms where um, students are from those Brahmin backgrounds and feel very uncomfortable or feel that it's impacting their educational experience, well, guess what? They're going to be liable regardless of whether there's a caste category or not, because ancestry would cover their casteism. We're going to continue to follow this. Uh, Suhag Shukla, executive director and co-founder of the Hindu American Foundation. Thank you so much for providing all this context for us. Thanks a lot.